which is an e-commerce application that we built natively for Joomla, and we being uh, Dioscori.com. Um, and I'll introduce, I guess, myself and the company in a minute. But first, I wanted to let you know what it is we're going to be doing today and how we're going to be doing it. Uh, this is just a general outline. Hopefully, you can all see that. Is that clear and big enough for everybody in the back? Christopher, there's more room up here if you want to come on up. There's a seat up here, too, if you want it. Great. So uh, this is the general outline of the talk. I'm going to introduce uh, myself, the company, and then talk about Tienda a little bit, why we decided to build it and how we built it, and then run into an actual live demo with you guys, during which uh, you're free to ask me any questions. Uh, I went to school at uh, an MBA program where we practiced the Socratic method, and uh, the, the, the lecturers didn't actually lecture. They just sort of guided the, the questions between students during an hour and a half session. So I'm expecting the same out of you guys, to so just field questions, I'll answer them. Might even try to get people in the audience to answer them instead of me, so uh, we'll see how that goes. Okay, so first I want to introduce the company and how it is we formed. Um, Dioscori Design formed two years ago, and um, at the time we just had one extension, Juga, which you may or may not have used before. Uh, it's an ACL extension for Joomla. Um, at the onset, we had about 10,000 users that registered very, very quickly for us, and, and that sort of encouraged me to go ahead and turn this into a full-fledged company. Um, and over the past two years, we've uh, signed on a bunch of different developers. We have now 18 members of the team, um, released another 15 extensions, of which Tienda is one, um, and amassed over 75,000 users in the past two years. We initially started out exclusively doing support for Juga and the other extensions that I wrote and released in the first year, uh, but have since grown into a company that does uh, business consulting and uh, full-fledged web design for clients as well. Uh, and some of the rules we live by include never hacking core files in Joomla. We want to preserve people's ability to upgrade. Um, we never encrypt our files. We always publish under the GPL, regardless of the size of a client, we'll, we'll insist on writing GPL code for them. Uh, we always hold on to the copyright, because when we're writing uh, extensions for clients, we want to be able to turn around and release them for public consumption. So we're always building, uh, with, with few exceptions, I mean, sometimes it's a very specific extension for that client and there's no actual public use for it. But uh, for the most part, we will write something that can be turned around and released for, for public consumption, whether for free or uh, as a commercial product. Uh, and we always try to write clean, readable code. That's a, that's a goal. We don't always reach it, but we try as hard as, as, hard as we can. Um, and this is who we actually are. Uh, the company itself uh, is just me and my wife, um, but we are uh, a bit of a meta company in that we've brought smaller one and two person design firms from around the world together. Um, and uh, together as a whole, we're able to approach larger companies and secure larger contracts than we ever would have been able to as uh, individual firms. So, you know, some of the, some of the companies that are partnered up underneath the Dioscori umbrella are listed up here. And another one is uh, Oleg's uh, Mind Kicking Lab. Um, um, and we're constantly growing. We're trying to bring in more and more partners because, like I said, together we're able to do a lot more than we ever, ever could have as uh, individuals. So, um, now about, that's enough about the company. This is who we are as developers. Um, the lead developers of Tienda itself are listed here on the left. Um, that's me up top. Uh, and the pictures aren't very good, but that's Jeremy and Fitz and Daniele. Um, two of them are in New York, one is in Italy. Uh, and they were the lead developers with me on the Tienda project. On the right side, you can see some of the rest of the team of Dioscori, and though they didn't contribute directly to the development of Tienda, they've all provided code to the shared code base that all of our extensions have. So when we make an improvement in one of the other extensions, generally that finds its way into, uh, I guess, the shared code base that trickles out to all the other extensions as well. So, uh, it's, it's not just the, the four of us leading the Tienda project, it's sort of everybody's contributing all at once to it. 
Now, who are you? Um, I know we're all here at Jane Beyond, but I want to know, I mean, how many of you are businesses that are not web design or Joomla integrators? Okay, all right, so no sort of end users here. How many of you are, are Joomla integrators and configurers that aren't necessarily developers? You know, someone who, okay. And how many of you are developers? Yes, okay, great, <laughs> good. Um, and how many of you are just here to learn a little bit more and aren't necessarily developers? Okay, very good. Great, okay. Uh, so let's talk about Tienda very quickly. And I'm gonna do this for maybe 10 minutes and then we're gonna get into the actual demo. Uh, Tienda is uh, an e-commerce extension for Joomla that is easy to use and at the same time very powerful and extensible built on Joomla's MVC framework. Um, it's not a bridge uh, from a, I guess, a third-party uh, extension into Joomla. And most importantly, it's commercially supported. Um, one part of our team just does support uh, and documentation. And so uh, the difference between this and a lot of the extensions out there is that there is a team of people that will be supporting it full-time if you want to purchase a support contract. Uh, and you might be wondering, there are other e-commerce extensions for Joomla out there. Why did we build Tienda from scratch as opposed to, say, assisting with the development of one of the existing ones? And I guess the long answer is that when it comes to an e-commerce extension that's easy to use for Joomla, that's also powerful, written in the MVC, and commercially supported, all of the things that we wanted out of an e-commerce extension, well, Joomla's just like frustratingly lacking. And, and building sites for, e building e-commerce sites with Joomla, with the tools that we had available to us, uh, we, we were constantly pulling our hair out. So uh, it's not that one particular extension is to blame, and I don't actually think there's any blame really to be assigned out there. It's just that they all have different strengths and different weaknesses, and we had tried to address them with, uh, with Tienda. I mean, without naming names, I mean, some of these are really complicated to use, um, or they're limited, or they aren't actually written on the Joomla MVC framework, um, or they're commercially unsupported. You know, things that, come on <laughs> Grab something from outside, I'm sure we can find room. <laughs> um, and these are all the issues that we wanted to address with Tienda. Uh, so we started from scratch. Uh, we, we designed a new database, that's what FIT specializes in. Um, and we started using uh, the, the, the base of code that we use for all of our extensions and then extended it from there to build out the, the different features in Tienda. And this is what we ended on. Um, this is a dashboard um, that you'll see during the demo. The emphasis was always on making it uh, user friendly. And our users are developers, you guys for the most part. Our users are um, people who integrate sites for their own clients. So we built Tienda with you guys in mind. Uh, I live on the admin side of my Joomla site. Um, I suspect as integrators and developers yourselves, you also spend most of your time on the admin side. So we started there. In fact, we try to start there for all of our extensions. Um, and I'll, get in, I'll go into detail about what's actually happening on the admin side dashboard during the demo. Uh, there are two versions of Tienda, one of which is uh, a community version, which is uh, free, as in free beer, and then another version which has um, uh, additional features that the community version doesn't have, and that one is a uh, commercial. Uh, you can still purchase a com commercial uh, support subscription for the community version, but if you want to, you can just download it for free, install it, and if you're a developer, as most of you guys are, you'll probably be able to figure it out and get it started in a very short amount of time. Um, these are the features that we have planned for both versions. Uh, I wrote this last November, so don't hold us to it. Uh, most of the features are planned for both, not finished yet. Uh, we're still in production beta. Um, and also, some of it is going to change. Like, for instance, um, due to, I guess, mass demand and people saying they wanted it over in the free version, we've decided to move the coupons feature from the enterprise over into the free version. Uh, and the same thing goes for the way we release uh, the features. We're not going to try to you know, bite off the entire project at once. 
So the first version of the enterprise version has those features rather than the other ones, um, including the one I'm really excited about, which is the third party vendors, allowing people to sell their own product through your Tienda store. Um, so like I said, all the features don't come out at once. We, we try to release things in, in phases. Uh, and this is the phase that we're I'm pretty happy we're keeping to it for the most part with the community version and the enterprise version. You should expect the community version, which you, which you can already get now as a, as a, like I said, a production beta. You can get it now. Um, we hope it'll be, um, I guess, feature frozen and an RC status by the end of Q2, which is the end of June, um, and stable at the same time, roughly. Enterprise version, I was hoping to have the alpha today. We might be able to demo a little bit of it. Um, it's, not, it's not ready yet, but the plan is for Q2 to release the first version. Um, and like I said earlier, releases come often, releases come early. The, with the community version of Tienda, we released the first version um, first week of February. We've had four or five releases since then, so they're coming at about two to two and a half week intervals. Um, so it's moving very, very quickly. We have, uh, I'll show you later on our project site, we have a lot of people who are contributing and helping out. And, and like I said, the project site is where all the magic is happening. Uh, I'm going to show you guys that very quickly. It's a place where you can see our roadmap. You can see what's been done, what's uh, going to be done. I guess that's the roadmap. Um, and you can track all the conversations between all of us and between the community who's helping develop. So if you, if, and we're just throwing out commit access like candy. So if you are a developer, like you are, and you're interested in participating on the development of an e-commerce project, the door is wide open. You can help if you want. Or you can just follow the action. You can just watch whatever issues you want to watch. And happily, the international community is growing uh, pretty quickly. Uh, I'm, I'm based in New York and trying to attend as many of uh, these kinds of events as possible internationally, trying to sort of spread the word of Tienda. And we, we've had already um, a Dutch site jump up. Um, I'm, I'm expecting a couple other ones that are, uh, I guess, geo-specific, language specific to pop up shortly as well. So um, if you're interested, just shoot me an email. So with that, let's just jump into the demo. And like I said earlier, feel free to interrupt me ask me any questions about functionality, um, and I'll answer it, hopefully, by demoing it for you. Oh, and also I wanted to give a big shout out to uh, the guys at Joomla Bamboo for putting together one of the demos that I'll be showing you, namely Anthony Olson and Jeremy Wilkin. Jeremy is here um, this week. Um, they put together a template for Tienda that um, overrides pretty much all of it. Um, and they said it was incredibly easy. So maybe if you're going to stick around for the, the development workshop after this session, um, we'll, do, we'll spend a little bit of time on template overrides and demonstrate to you how bloody easy it is to do it with Tienda. OK, so this is what we're going to be doing during the demo. Like I said, interrupt me at any point and ask me any questions you have. OK? Let me go back there. OK. So, can you guys see that? I mean, I could change the resolution a little bit if you want. No? So this is the, the dashboard that you'll see right upon installing Tienda. Uh, some of the key points um, I want to bring up here are, I guess, the summary of all the data in your store that you're getting. Um, if I could refresh, you'll see that this is a flash-based graph um, with two tabs, one showing the, I guess, raw number of sales you've had in your store, um, but also the dollar figure for them. Uh, and this we modeled after Magento, honestly, Magento. Did you create the flash charts also, or is that This is a fusion charts. Uh, we wrote this also um, as a plugin. So, depending on the browser your clients are going to be using, you can actually disable it. I know that uh, with IE, you actually have uh, a little bit of a conflict with Fusion Charts. So, if you want, you can just disable the plugin. It's this guy right here. Um, and when you go back to the dashboard, it'll just default to uh, 
well, I don't have internet. It defaults to Google Charts, uh, so, which requires an internet connection, but I don't have one in here, so. Um, connecting, yeah. <laughs> we'll see if that happens. Let's try this guy. Anyway, <laughs> that's a good sign. Um, so you can change that to anything you want. I mean, if there's a, a non-flash graphing tool you wanted to use, you could change it right away. I'm going to go ahead and re-enable it. The other thing to take note on in the, in the dashboard is that uh, this, these figures are all responding to the range that you've selected here. So if you just wanted today's sales or the year-to-date sales, you can perform that and the, the, GART will, the chart will change and reflect that data range that you've selected. Um, over here on the right, you've got summary data being displayed in modules. So these, the same way that this is a, a plug-in here, these are just normal modules that you can place anywhere on your admin side. Um, this is one showing your recent orders, and uh, you can click on it and immediately dive into that order. Um, and if you wanted to, if you were using, um, I don't even know if this is enabled right now. Let me take a quick look here. If you're using an admin side template, like our fingertips or like the, uh, the ones from Joomla Praise. Have you guys heard of the Joomla Praise admin praise template? It allows you to completely skin the admin side to make it whatever you want. Well, you could place these modules from the Tienda dashboard anywhere you want. So if you were handing the site off to a client uh, and you wanted the page that they immediately log into to have their store summary data, you can do that with, let me show you. I don't have it here. Give me one sec. You could take, for instance, these guys. Oh, I have to copy it in the module manager. Here we go. So I'm going to copy these guys. They were probably placed in the left position. position. And then when you go to the control panel, well, the module is supposed to display there. I can't get it going right now. I can't even find the copy that I made. Oh, because it's not enabled. Great. I'm just placing these in the right position. And then using the fingertips module manager to manage that position. We want it just to show up on the C panel. Let's do the same thing here. Great. So now when you log in to your C panel, you can actually get um, all that summary data here. And you could, you could do the same thing with the main portion here um, and put whatever, whatever modules you wanted. So if you're handing a site off to a client who's literally only going to be managing uh, an e-commerce store with it, you can, you can make it so that right when they log in, that's all they see. Uh, so back to Tienda. This down here is showing summary stats. And uh, you can rearrange these also, because they're just normal modules. 
Uh, and then down here, you've got one-click access to our support center and also uh, submitting a bug. You can actually uh, do that directly from, from the Tienda dashboard. Uh, if, you, if you encounter something, just let us know. It sends us an email and automatically adds it to our, our project site tracker. So that's pretty much all on the dashboard that I really wanted to show you. Um, there are two positions, the right side, which you saw me tooling with earlier, and then the main part here where you could put whatever other modules you wanted. And that same, also you could put additional tabs here in this section to show the additional data that you want. Any questions there? Yeah. What about different users here in this context? Means um, you have shop administrators, you have shop managers, you have other people who just uh, have to see um, the last sales, and you have somebody who, ha who is um, allowed to change the product. Right. And so um, they all have to see different modules. Uh, do you have any ACL uh, uh, here in or? Because, because we're just using Joomla's module manager to display everything, um, whatever access level you associate with the modules within the Joomla module manager in, in 1.6 will uh, then be reflected in the dashboard. So if you're logging in with an admin side manager role and you've assigned that group to only see, say, the recent orders module as opposed to the recent stats one, the recent stats won't display. So we're, we didn't recreate any kind of ACL. We were, we were deliberately just using what Joomla gives you. And the same thing goes for, I'll show you later on, pricing. Uh, you can have different prices for different user groups. We didn't build that into Tienda itself. We wanted to just use the ACL in 1.6 to allow you to assign different prices to different user groups. Um, so I'm going to next jump over to the configuration tab because I figure when you're, when you're putting together the store, you'll first start with the base configuration and then make your way over into the product catalog. And then after creating the product catalog, your main interaction on the admin side will be managing orders. So we're going we're gonna to follow that logic across. Configuring is done here. Uh, these are normal sliders in Joomla. Uh, and if, if you write a plugin to extend Tienda, you can very easily add a new configuration section here. Um, the, the default ones include setting the shop info, all the, all the things you would expect. Um, one of the neat ones Daniele wrote is uh, uh, one-click ability to resize all your product and category and manufacturer images. Um, and this is particularly useful if, say, you FTP up, all of, if you FTP upload all of your images and they aren't sized correctly, you can just uh, click one button. It'll go through and resize all the images to an appropriate setting. Um, you can set the, the store's default currency, the, the way it's going to display the date, um, and uh, default measurement units, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these are some order and checkout settings. Uh, we had a few people making specific requests about some of the European requirements for checkout and price display. Uh, and so we just got those features added in uh, in time for this, present, this conference here, including uh, whether or not uh, terms must be accepted upon checkout, um, whether or not the, the shipping tax on, uh, on orders should be displayed, whether or not the cost of shipping needs to be displayed next to a product when you're viewing it on the front end. These are things that we don't actually have to do in the U.S., but uh, we were notified about them for European stores, and we just quickly put them into the, into the core. And you can set these, make these settings here. Same thing goes with enabling a guest checkout and uh, affixing a prefix to your orders. You can do that all from here. Are yep. those uh, options uh, geospecific? As in, if the user is from Germany, would they so see it? Um, it's going to be universal to the store. So at this point, no. But that's a good idea, actually. Uh, we hadn't thought about doing that, but um, we are planning on making bundles, like pre-setup pre packages of Tienda. So I think we could certainly put together a US one and then a European one that would have the different settings yeah. preset. Does your checkout workflow on the front end ask for address first? 
Yes, I'll show you. I'll show you guys that a little bit later. So you could easily display or not depending on the address, the country they provide, and the workload. If they're logged in, even just by a template override for the product view pages, right. you could figure out where they are located and d display a different bit of information. Um, until they begin that checkout process, if they're a guest or whatnot, you right. wouldn't be able to. Right. Or no, you would be able to, but not with the current TNS. Yeah, Yeah, you, you could just do it by the GOIP. Um, and here are those settings about displaying the product prices with tax, displaying it with a link to a, a shipping article that explains your shipping costs. Um, and I'll show you what all of these things look, at, look like on the front end once we finish going through the admin side. Um, so those are all the configuration settings. And like this tip says here, um, all your plugins will create a configuration tab or slider here. So you'll be able to manage everything from one site or from one section. Uh, these will go into probably more in the uh, workshop, but we wrote our tools and our reports to be just Joomla plugins. So uh, we wrote a sample for each one. But for example, this, this is just a normal Joomla plugin that performs a, a multi-step report on uh, whatever data you want. So uh, if you want to write a, a report that grabs, I don't know, your, your best customers, you know, the ones who make the per most purchases or the, or the highest dollar figure purchases. It's a very easy report to create. If you're familiar enough to build a Joomla plugin, you can write a simple report for Tienda. And I'll show you that later. So this is one just doing a, a report on best-selling products here. Um, okay. The localization tab is probably the next thing you'll go into. Um, you can hear under this part, Enable and disable countries, create new ones if you want. Um, the, the taxes were something that we really got reamed on when I went to uh, Toronto to make this presentation. Uh, they have some really complicated tax issues in Canada, and we weren't uh, addressing all of them in February. Uh, we've gotten them all resolved since then, except for some of the very specific product-based taxes that uh, we're going to leave to that minor We'll let somebody else build that as an extension to, to Tienda. But for the most part, creating tax zones, uh, shipping zones, really simple. You're creating uh, geo zones, which are just sort of uh, lumping together of individual zones. And a zone is uh, like a region in a particular country. Or in the case of the US, there would be states. So if we wanted to say create um, a, a European VAT zone, um, it's as simple as, say, how about we call it? Germany has the VAT, right? I don't know. Or maybe we could call it the UK VAT if you wanted. This is going to be either a shipping or a tax zone. Um, and then assigning zones to it is as simple as uh, filtering them out from this light box here. So if I wanted, if, what is this, the Germany VAT? We can select all of the regions within Germany and assign them all to it. So that's created a new, uh, a new geo zone that you can use to assign very specific tax rates to just those zones, which will be related to either the billing or the shipping address of the user as they check out. Uh, and you can do the same thing for shipping zones. So after doing that, if you want, you can does uh, specify different currencies that your store will use. Um, I need the internet in order to do this. It gets real-time uh, exchange rates. Uh, it's going to fail here because I don't have internet. Uh, it's, it's querying uh, Yahoo to get those real-time exchange rates. You can override that with a plugin if you wanted to get it from Google or if you wanted to get it from your preferred exchange rate source. Um, pretty simple. Um, it's going to hang here for a bit since I don't have internet. And you preloaded all countries and regions? Preloaded all countries and regions, yeah. So it's very simple to create the new ones, uh, to lump them together in the geo zones as you want. Um, but yeah, all that's preloaded, comes in install, upon install. And all currencies, you also support the currencies as well? Yeah, you can manually create the currencies. The ones that it comes by default with are uh, the US dollar, euro, pound. Um, I think the yen, 
but it's, it's like a two-step process to create a new currency if you want it. Okay, I'm gonna get out of here since it's hanging. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, you can create custom tax classes. Uh, and what this means, well, actually you can see it right there. Like for instance, in New York, you will tax clothing, but you won't tax handbags. So you'll have to have a specific tax class for particular products, and you can, you can create an unlimited number here, and you, you would set then the rates. In the, in the majority of stores you're probably going to create, you're just going to set a taxable, a tax class, and then a non-tax goods ta class. Um, and the tax goods will, you'll just set the rates based on GeoZone here. Um, this tax rate description, if you're displaying each byline in an order, um, this is what will display. And here you just set the rate for each GeoZone. Uh, yep? Right. And for customers, it's, it's, uh, depends on the country. Is it also possible to, uh, to use it? You would probably um, set up an ACL, a, a, a group within Joomla for those users, or at least in the in the way it's currently written, you would exempt those users with an with a plugin override based on their their uh, Joomla ACL level. Right. So you'd create, say, a uh, wholesale, this is almost like a the wholesale situation where you're not taxing them. Uh, you'd create a wholesale user group, assign that user to the wholesale user group, and then use a plugin to deduct all the tax charges from their orders. Okay. Yep. Right. Um, I, we, we'll probably just do it natively, um, but right now you could do it with uh, plugins. Um, we, have, we override the user registration form, um, so you could add a field for the VAT ID to the user registration form, and then when the registration form is saved, you can save it to wherever you want, and then use that, whether it's present or not. I know that you have to verify VAT ID, right? Yeah. You could... It's on my label. It's check, check on European VAT ID. Check. You have to check it? Yeah, I mean, you could, you could also verify it upon saving it. Uh, you could verify it during checkout. I mean, you could, there are a bunch of different plugin events throughout the checkout process, throughout all of Tienda that you could use to, to trigger that sort of action. It's based on if seller and buyer must be saving the commodity ID, that means that the uh, that ID is zero. Yeah. It's not based on group or ACL or something. It's when we check the seller and buyer, both must be the one uh, European ID. Okay. Yeah, so that's something you could do with a plugin override. Yeah. Um, and the last thing is, or underneath the localization tab, is the shipping. We initially shipped Tienda in February with just uh, database driven shipping, but Daniele recently refactored it entirely uh, so that we could do re real time shipping quotes from whatever shipping service you want. And again, these are like the reports and the tools. They're just normal Joomla plugins. Um, if, you're, if, you build a, if you build any other plugin, you can build a plugin that will uh, query your favorite shipping service, whatever, it's, whatever it is. Um, but we also have standard shipping methods also being powered by a plugin that allow you to create um, uh, the different shipping methods you use on the site and uh, store the actual rates per order inside the database. So if you don't need anything as complex as real-time shipping rates, you don't need to. I guess that's the point. And here you're setting the rates again based on the shipping method type, say flat rate or ground. You set the rates here based on the geo zone. Um, and you can specify range, or excuse me, price, handling fee, and then the weight range to which this applies. Um, and that's all under the localization tab. Yeah. Can you use uh, more languages for your Tienda on your site? Can you translate your product, your descriptions for your product? That was something, 
you have, you have several different options for doing that. That was something that was just finished. In fact, no, I don't have internet, so I'm not going to do it. Um, one of the guys from the Junefish team, uh, Evo, uh, recently wrote um, all the Junefish elements necessary for translating your, your catalog, uh, your descriptions and everything. Yeah, through Junefish. Um, you know, I'm also a partner with the Nuku guys, so we'll make sure that that works with, with their product as well. Um, it's not native, it's handled by translation components. The, the forms look like this for managing your catalog. Uh, this is a nested category set. We're extending the, the, the core 1.6 Joomla nested categories libraries. Um, you can uh, create new ones, rebuild the tree, um, select products associated with the categories here. And the form itself is pretty simple. Creating a new category is as simple as uh, putting in the name. Um, whether or not it has a parent, why don't we just put it in cameras, enable it, and maybe upload an image. How about that? <coughs> Um, I'll show you later what those, um, oops, I could have just hit apply, what these uh, layout file overrides do. Um, but for now, I just wanted to show you this. The other fun things are when you're managing your catalog, you don't have to jump back to the list in order to move from item to item if you're editing a bunch all at once. So you saw earlier that the, uh, the list, the next one in the list after new category demo is components. So while you're here, once you're done editing it, you can just click Save and Next and jump right to the next item. So you don't have to go back and forth. It'll save you a couple clicks. Uh, you can also do Save and Previous or Save and Create a New One here. Can you import? Can you notice? Not yet. I mean, you can import during a migration. Say if you're coming from either Xcart or Virtumart, you can import them that way. We haven't built like a CSV or an XML importer just yet for it. But we're working on it. It's an open issue. So. Um, you can reorder them here. And like I said, you can also select the products. So we just created that new category demo. Selecting the products to be in that category um, is just as easy as doing that. And then disabling one or two. And you can have products associated with multiple categories. Um, that there are some issues with, not issues, uh, I'll explain which template override would get used in a situation like that if you had a category, excuse me, a product in multiple categories and each category had different templates. Um, but that's a very specific instance, not very relevant. Managing products also has the same format you would expect. Um, the cool thing about this list here, b besides being able to select the categories for the product, set the prices and set the quantities, all using the same light boxes you've seen throughout the interface, is that you can quickly find um, the product you're looking for when you're managing the store using the filter items, the filter line here. So for instance, if you only wanted products that are between 10 and $100 to show up in the list, you can do that. And if you only wanted to see the ones that have between zero and five quantity, like say you're trying to uh, uh, manage their quantity. You can, you can do that sort of complex filtering right from within the interface here. Uh, and then from there, just jump right into it. And the, uh, you saw that t-shirt was the previous item in the list. Uh, these save and previous and save and next buttons are responsive to the filters that you'd placed on the, on the list. So the only two items that you can actually jump between are the t-shirt and the, uh, what was the other one? Third, it's a good product name. So um, the form for creating a new one, I guess I could have hit new, looks like this. Um, setting basic information, uh, a full description, and a short description. Uh, and then down at the very bottom, some, I guess, miscellaneous additional information, including the manufacturer, whether or not the product requires shipping or not. Um, and again, I'll, I'll talk about the template overrides later, but you can set them here. Uh, and then over on the right, you set prices, tax class, 
um, whether or not the, the product is, I guess, digital or not, you know, so whether or not you have an unlimited inventory or not, um, the multiple categories it's allowed to be in, um, and then images. Oh, and also files. It handles, uh, you can sell uh, digital products with Tienda. Yep? Um, in the case with uh, t-shirts, is it possible to uh, create attributes? I mean, uh, uh, size and color? Yeah, so why don't we take a look at that one. Um, with t-shirts, um, this is what it looks like after you create the product. Um, it's got multiple categories here, and you can do one-click remove uh, of the item from categories. Um, you've got multiple images associated with the particular product, and you can view and manage the gallery here, um, including making one of them default or deleting them. Um, you, you asked about attributes. Oh, and this one has a PDF file associated with it, so in case your t-shirt had a manual, you could, you could as associate it. Um, the product attributes are all listed here, and I'll show you how that's managed. Um, it already has, I guess, most of the, what's another one that we could create here? How about, um, wow, material. material is already up there. Give me another one. What's another attribute of a t-shirt? Type of brand, maybe? I've got sleeve length. How about body length? We're just going to make up an attribute. Collar type. OK, so creating an attribute. Now we've got collar type. It was added down here. You can change the order of the attributes as they'll be displayed on the front end. Um, and setting the options form goes like this. Opens up a sub light box. And what are the collar types? V-neck. You can specify whether or not it has a positive or negative or zero um, uh, impact on the base price. So let's say this one has no impact on the price. Um, what was the other one? Um, so this is going to be. I, um, uh, when I tried Tienda in, in April, I found it's not unique. And when you browse the internet for stop keeping unique, you will find in Wikipedia, for example, that it is unique by definition. This is what the SKU is. Right. And um, I'm interested in, in your, let's say, concept of how is a product unique? What makes it unique? Uh, the, the key in the database or the SKU or what else? And how is this combined with uh, options, with attributes, for example? So if you have colors, um, Usually, uh, they are coded in, in SKU right. or not. Uh, how is your concept of it? This is all, this would be in this case of, a, of, a, of an item that has attributes. You would set the base SKU here. And then if, it, if you were adding, say, hyphen S or hyphen S, M, popped, can you or whatever. It if it's you can configure everything you want um, via plugin. So if you wanted this one to have um, a unique SKU when the user actually adds it to their cart. Um, right now it's going to have just the base SKU, which is common across all of the t-shirt variations based on these attributes. And then if you wanted it to have a different SKU when they added it to their cart, it would have it based on the different attribute selections that they made. So at the database level, the SKU is not being enforced to, to be unique. It's, it can be whatever you want it to be. Does this answer? How, this? how can this be done? by plug-in or not. Yes. Because my experience with the user is um, they, they don't, um, yeah, they forget about this, that it should be unique. And maybe they, they have it unique in their company, that if they enter new products, they use an old SKU, uh -huh. and then everything is mixed up. Uh, you know, at the plug-in level, you could say, upon save, check the unique status of the SKU give them a notice and redirect back to the form and say, fix the SKU. Uh, it wasn't unique. Um, you could change the SKU on the plugin level upon save. Uh, you could, I mean, there, there are probably several different ways that you could handle that sort of situ situation. Um, but at Tienda itself um, is treating it just as a text field that you as the admin manage. Does that make sense? A unique field. Right. 
Yeah. Okay. This would be great. Yeah. Okay. Does Tienda does have inventory control. Is that the office we have to link to the SPP? We have, say, six blue shirts left and three red ones. And how, how, can you, how can you tell if the SKU is not unique for each type of T-shirt? The record has a unique entry in the database. Yeah, the, the record has a unique indicator. And when you're setting the quantities based on the attribute level, we're actually displaying for you the attribute combination as opposed to the SKU. But this you could override if you wanted and make it display a unique SKU for that particular attribute combination. Does that make sense? So with this, with, this can be template overridden and you could make it display an attribute based on the base SKU for the product plus um, attribute combination based on, or excuse me, SK, SKU suffix based on the attribute combination. Does that make sense? What are you basically saying at the moment? You're entering the SKU manually. Yes. At the moment, it's you're manually entering. The system. You're entering it manually. So you've got full control of it. But if you want it automatic. You can make it automatic. Yeah. yeah. So yes, it will be unique if you put it in unique. <laughs> and this, this, this quantity setting list there is uh, generated based on the list of attributes that you find and that it's, uh, it's a full combination of all possible attributes. Correct. This is, this is every possible attribute. This is every possible unique shirt that your attribute combinations create. So right now, you know, it's just starting with uh, the first attribute and running through every unique combination there. And then it jumps to the next variation on the first attribute, which is size, and it's going to give you every variation there as well. So you can set your quantities based on the attribute combinations. Uh, you have to do it one by one right now, product by product. Um, we, we have an open request for um, something that would address that, which is like product cloning or uh, a, adding an attribute to a category. Uh, it's not in right now. It's not in. I mean, we, we tried to address, address the, the base at first, but I mean, that's certainly something you could do now by a plug-in, or you can just wait until we build it out. That's not built yet, but we're working on it. Yeah. And sorry, and the next one. Uh, in SKU question, yeah, when we define one product t shirt with SKU 001, mm -hmm. the next one is an attribute like, is it, is it for black, black t shirt, yeah? But maybe you want to use the different SKU for, for blue or red, uh, red uh, t shirt. Mm -hmm. yeah? But you define us as an attribute. But you can. Uh, Collect attribute with, with these different SKU that's been in, in checkout and in invoice. Oh, certainly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there, there are stores like Best Buy that do it that way, where each unique combination of attributes is a different product. Um, and they, instead of, instead of creating one base product called T-shirt with different attributes like small, medium, large, black, green, red, yeah. they have a completely different product and they just manually enter the SKU. Um, and that product, the product title will be T-shirt, black, large, right? And, and that will have a unique SKU. So you could, you could do it that way, or you could use a plug-in to manually create, excuse me, to automatically create an SKU based on your attributes. Um, so that's here. The, the prices also opens up in a light box the same way. Um, this is just a base price. You can set date ranges for when prices are valid. Um, and also, we do uh, volume-based discounts. So in this case, if they're just buying zero to, or let's create a new range. How about if, if they're buying over 100 um, t-shirts, let's give them a $1 discount. And set this one to expire at 100. So now the base t-shirt price is going to be 14 if they buy over 100 items. And I think that's all to see on this page. I have it set to not require shipping. OK, great. Uh, same thing as before, save and new, save and next when you're editing the shirts. Um, Let's reset the form. Okay. 
so that's the admin side when you're initially setting up the store. Before I jump to the front end, do you guys have any other admin side and configuration questions? Yeah. yeah. The, there are several different ways to do it. Um, the, I'll show you this in a second. The front end display of each product fires off content plugin events. So this description here, um, you could fire off any, any plugins you want. So if you're using a, a global plugin, excuse me, a, a global tag manager for your site, you could do it that way. We, ha we have a client that we're building that feature requested. Um, so it'll shortly be in the in native in Tienda, but if you wanted it now, you'd have to use a global plugin. But we will be allowing, uh, I guess, product relations via tagging methods. Um, uh, I think we're gonna finish this up in late June, so it'll be out there shortly. Now, let's jump to the front. Yep. Is it possible to sell uh, products, um, let's say, uh, with serial number? as in a custom field. You, you, can, you can add any field you want to this form, including a serial number for the product. Um, what I actually mean is not serial number, uh, something like a coupon, number coupon. It means you have a, a list of coupons. Uh, is this list you get from, 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 let's say, other companies, and you want to sell these numbers. Oh, I see. So in that case, would the product title be, the, I guess, this, the unique code, the serial code? And you would just be importing a, a CSV of products? They are all the same product. Um, and for example, um, yeah, if, if, you, uh, if you have uh, prepaid ca uh, uh, cards uh -huh. for your mobile phone, yeah? They are the same product, but each has a different number. I got gotcha. you. Okay. The number is the value you sell. And um, in your store, you have one product. Right. But underneath the, the product, you have a list of numbers which you actually sell. Is this possible? Um, out of the box right now, no. I think you'd have to do some customization to, to make it do that. Um, I'm not sure, there are probably several different ways to solve that, but I, you know, it would require some modification right now. Well, uh, not the scanning portion. We haven't built that in, but uh, um, in short, no. We ha we ha we didn't we didn't build out that feature set. It's a neat idea. Our product status, product status uh, as in order status? The, there's definitely an order status. So okay. I mean, okay. all of that. So it's a shift or or yeah. So uh, after I go through a, a front end checkout, we'll come back to the orders page and I'll show you what you can do with orders. Uh, I guess I could show you right now. Um, so for example, uh, this is the, the orders management page. You can filter by date range. So if you wanted just the ones from the last month, you can do that filtering here. Uh, when you actually jump into an order, like say one of these that's in prepayment status, um, this is the order management page. Uh, you've got information on order number, date, customer, shipping address, payment information, and then also the product purchased. Um, and over here, we, we track the history of the order. So if somebody ships it, you can uh, specify it as shipped. You can notify the customer yes or no. Um, and when you update the order, 
um, it, whether if you chose to notify the customer that the status has changed, it'll, it'll, uh, it'll send them an email and it's changed the order status. So, you know, depending on whatever remote system you're using to scan the boxes, um, this has a unique order number. You probably affix that to the barcode, and when, when you scan it, you'd send it over to Tienda, and Tienda would address it by adding a new order history status here. Um, and also, you can jump from order to order. If you're, if you're addressing a bunch of them, you can do that here. Yep. Invoicing? Uh, we, we don't have, a, I guess, a really mature way of doing it, but uh, from within this page, you can print an invoice. Uh, this link here will show you um, a very stripped down invoice that you can print for the user. Um, Um, it's a different layout, uh, so you can override it and make it do whatever you want. Um, I think you asked a question also about the order number that's used um, and whether or not the, it would be like a test order or a real order. Okay, yeah. Right, okay, so that's, okay. The, it, it uses just the auto increment in the SQL database as the unique ID for the order, but you can affix um, a, a prefix to the order if you want, to every single order, and that's over here. So in this case, I'm just affixing to every order just OR and then slash. Yeah, I guess that's legible. What about uh, generating a PDF, for example? Is this possible? Uh, there are different services that allow you to print directly to a PDF. Okay. So yeah, I mean, it, 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 it outputs a, a printable format that's just stripped down with your company shop information at the top and then the order information. And you can send that directly to a PDF using whatever printer you have. So let's take a look at the front end. Uh, I have two front ends that I want to show you. Uh, this is just a, a standard one using a, a, a Joomlart template. And then this is the one that Joomla Bamboo put together um, with template overrides. Um, and I, I want to show you this one second uh, to show you the difference that just a template override can make. So uh, a, a standard product view, I'm sorry, let's go to the product overview. So this is just the entry page for the store. It's showing you all the different uh, product categories you have. Um, and again, this is completely overridable. Um, diving into a particular category, if it has subcategories, they'll be displayed underneath. Um, and then the products will be listed as such, displaying the model number and if present, an SKU number. Um, excuse all of the different test products in the site. I didn't review it recently. Um, diving into a product, oh, you'll notice that in this case, the, uh, the short description being displayed here is just a, a truncated version of the long description, but you have uh, the option on the admin side of specifying two different, two, di two different descriptions, one to be used in the product browser and, and one to be used in the actual product view page. Um, where, do you, where do you get the images from? Could you link to upload to Flickr, for example? Uh, the product images right now are all being handled um, in this demo by what I've uploaded. Um, if you wanted to pull images from a, an external service, I don't know if is there a Joomla plugin that does that already. You don't know. Does anybody know if there is one? So you could, you know, this description right here fires off content plugin events. So you could insert a tag here saying display a gallery of images from Flickr using whatever Flickr unique ID, and it would display that gallery of images here. So.
Not actually right now. Right now. That's what you're asking? Okay, no, not right now. Not right now. Yeah, right now they're all local. They're all being stored on the, on the server here. You certainly can. I think it was the t-shirt that had multiple images. And I can't remember what category we put it in. Was it software? Yes. That makes perfect sense, right? <laughs> um, so the, this one has multiple images here. Um, and they show up down like this. And, and you could override that any way you wanted. Um, this is right now um, the way that it's the the way that the attributes are being displayed. The, the the stock will depend on your, I guess, available quantity for this attribute selection here. So in the t in the case of the T-shirt, I didn't think we set any quantities, but why don't we? Um, how about for the Small green long cotton v neck. Small green, oh, I need to refresh, sorry. Small green long cotton v neck. Now we have one in stock, so we can actually add it to your cart. Whereas the other combination didn't have any, have any available. There's a JavaScript event fired, which is enabling what you're seeing here. Um, you could override that JavaScript event and make it change the image if you wanted as well. But you'd have to associate those images with the attribute combination. Yeah. Right. So you could do it by naming convention, whatever you wanted, certainly. Um, adding a product to a cart looks like this, but you'll see in the shop front in the template override, you can, you can override the way this looks. Um, uh, with just a template override. In fact, you don't even need to display this uh, light box uh, when a user adds something to their cart. You can, because that's also being set. Tienda is also being told to do that on the template level. Uh, so from here, they could jump to the shopping cart or begin the checkout or simply just close the window and continue shopping. Uh, and it's telling them the attributes for the particular product here. Um, and it also updated the shopping cart module uh, to display how many they have in there, in their cart. Um, we can jump to another product. Let's say a camera. Do the same thing, how about 10? And then why don't we view the shopping cart? Um, again, the user the user's not logged in here. So they're getting just the menu that has the uh, shopping cart tab. Um, if they were logged in, they'd have the ability to view their account, et cetera, et cetera. I'll do that in a second. But uh, you can um, remove items from your cart here. You can jump back to the product view page if you want um, and add more. Update the quantities here or just simply begin checkout. Um, why don't we begin checkout? Because I'm not logged in, it, takes me to this quick login page where you can do um, either a login, register as a new user, and then continue your checkout, or check out as a guest. Uh, check out as a guest is something you can enable and disable on the admin side. Um, I'm just going to log in. And this, I think I actually have more items in my cart. so. Let me go ahead and remove these. 14 MacBooks. No, thank you. All right, so let's begin checkout. Now that I'm logged in, yep. When you click on uh, view your card uh, inside the shopping cart module here, you have this, this, uh, uh, this overlay, right? This, what do you mean by overlay? Oh, the light box? Yeah, the light box now. No, not right now. Although I think, hold on. I think we, that may have been added as a feature to, uh, instead of take you directly to your cart, 
it would do the light box. Let me check if that's in here. Display cart in a light box. Yeah. So if, if you wanted to do that, you can do that. And of course, this is also overridable at the template level, so you can make it do whatever you wanted. And can you configure it that uh, the light box is not used at all? You mean store-wide? Before you had, uh, before you showed us the light uh, box, and um, is it possible to have the other view? We are just looking at now this one, this view. Oh, or this view? Cart. To have it go directly to the cart? Yeah. Yeah, that's what it was on, by default. So um, let me change the module setting here. And then refresh. Here, I'll go to the user dashboard. So now when you click on view your cart, it's not going to open it up in a light box. The checkout? Um, yep. How does the user get back to uh, fr from here? From, from the view, from the, the shopping cart right. to, um, to uh, not to check out, but uh, to buy other products. Uh, we had somebody request that because there's so many different routes into the shopping cart, if you wanted to do a continue shopping link, yeah. um, you could do that conditional based on whether or not they were actually coming from the product browser. Um, you can do that now at the, at the template override level, but we have an open feature request for, some, for that to be put in there. Because like for instance right now, if I go to the order history and then jump to my shopping cart, the continue shopping button really would just take you here to this, yeah. to the product overview page. So. But you certainly, I mean you could do that at the template level now. Uh, I showed this to, to users and they told me if you're here uh, looking at the MP3 player, looking in get uh, uh, the, the shopping cart and then you want to come back to the, to, to the product you just had, this is, this is impossible now. Well, if you, were, if you wanted to get back to the same product, so for instance, let's go through that workflow and just add, say, uh, a free woman. You can add, oh, she's not in stock. <laughs> That's too bad. So how about we go and <laughs> add windows to your box. Um, after adding it to your cart, if you end up in the view shopping cart page and you want to continue shopping, you can actually click right on the product itself. And that... The user does not know this. No, uh, that's true. I guess, um, I mean, like I said, it's not impossible. It's something that you have to do on a template override level. The link would help very much. Right. We do have it as an open feature request. Um, Yep. Uh, to do checkouts, uh, you saw uh, there were two, three options. Uh, the last option, uh, the guest option, is it to, uh, uh, to use, to, to, to give people without your accounts a possibility to buy stuff at their store? That's correct. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Uh, can you can. Show that as well? Yeah, actually. So let's. Yeah. I just logged out, and I'm going to add a new item to my cart. It started a new session. So let's do Windows and begin checkout as a, or let me start that over. Let me view my cart. So let's go back to the software. I'm not logged in and I'm adding a product to the cart and I'm going to begin checkout. And instead of either of these options, I'm just going to do checkout as a guest and it blew up on me. <laughs> oh, I think it's, okay. So this is the new feature that he just added in. Yeah, that's well, wonderful. <laughs> right? But the idea is you collect the data. That's right, you can see it happening sort of here. You would collect at least an email address. You collect the normal billing information, shipping information. Um, I think this is happening because it's not logged in and it's a plugin. I'll figure out why that's happening. Um, can the user uh, check the status of the, the order? What happens after they submit the order is they have a, an, a user ID silently created for them 
in the system and they're automatically logged in and then you associate that order with the user ID. From the, what happens is they are given the user ID based on their email address, they're emailed the password, and they're automatically logged in. So after they've logged in, they're taken to their, upon checkout, they're taken to the order confirmation page, um, excuse me, the uh, order review page where you can see the invoice. And they've, since they've already been logged in, they can do whatever they want managing the account. The username's based on their email. So we, we collect their email address and use that as the, uh, as the username. I wonder if people are going to be maybe, oh, I'm going to check out if you guess because I don't want you to have any of my information. I wonder if there's a chance they might get a little annoyed at that. I, I, I saw some things recently, and the email had a, a link I could click for a shipping update. Right. It was like Samsung TV Edward for sure or something. I never had an account with them at the store, sent it back. All I got from them was a link to my update of my repair. Right. Without ever having an account, yeah. you know, I wonder if some people might, my like for instance, if someone wants to give me their money, I don't need their email address. I can take their money. As long as I know where to send the product, you know right. what I mean? Uh, I if that, you know, but if you don't get their email address, how do they, how do you send not, them that you're email? Not validating, I mean, yeah, that's true. But you're not validating their email address either, right? No, I'm not validating the email address either, so. Um, you must have to show what's happened in the soul when the next time, if you say, email address I want to use as a guest. They get, they get notified that it's, there's a, there's a validation happening when they enter the, the email address that'll say, this isn't a properly formatted email address. This is already present in our database. Please log in. Um, I think those are the two scenarios we catch. It looks. We could do that. Right. When I type a mistyped email address and the oh, same, I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> the same, this user I was already used, uh, so use a password remember or password activating from, from blank user to active user and send me a mail and send the mail then to different users. Then it's a mix of real guests and hidden logic in the user. Right. It's not, we, we tied everything to the user ID, so at the, at, at the current level that Tienda has been built to, you wouldn't be able to perform a checkout without a user ID somewhere created during the process. Um, I don't even, I don't know how we'd resolve that. Yeah, it uses, we just, we create a user account inside the JOS users database table. I think and it's work to take this uh, under and, uh, right. right. If you use, for example, if you have the send an email registration, uh, selected from the options for coming to that, then the registration doesn't work. The user gets an email with a password that he cannot lock in the site because uh, the community builder uses another tool to, to create this registration link. Gotcha. So what we could do in that instance is create another plugin or modify the plugin that creates the user account um, and tell it to also check if CB is installed. And if so, I think it's just a different blocked field inside a different database table. To add to the, we could. That'd be good. It, it uses the com user database. Yeah. 
we didn't we didn't replace we extended it a little bit to store shipping and billing information for users, but um, and actually we don't modify the well, user data. That's right. Okay. That's right. What happens to the information after this, this, this product has, has been shipped and is still complete or in the trash ship? All, all of that information is still kept. So what do you do if, if that user comes a second time and wants to purchase something else and again it is his email address? Do you then uh, get another user with the same email address? Or somehow no, it, it, gets, gets, it gets verified while they're typing in their email address. The, Current workflow is oh, okay. You've already got an account. Please log in. So what is the point of uh, allowing this option uh, via the guest? But why do you need all my information stored in the, in the just user table instead of just you enter your uh, email address, your ship, shipment date, etc., and store it in a separate table from the vendor, and then ship my stuff and delete my account after 30 days or something, like that. delete the state, and next time when I come. And I can write again my email address because I want to do it this way. I want a uh, user on your website. Uh, the user themselves doesn't need it. Right now, we tie everything to the user ID in Tienda. So Tienda right now needs a user ID to associate the order with um, and also to associate um, user info, for example, like the, the address, um, in order to maintain the integrity of the store's systems. Um, I think if, if it's an issue that users don't want their shipping or billing information to even be stored even with orders that they made, I think we could come up with some way to, to address that. How is how not to question you, but to question Germany's laws, how is how does a user not know that their address is being stored by a store where they checked out giving them their address? When I register and I'm checking a button that I uh, that I'm accepting the terms, etc., then I know that I register for this website and I have a confirmation now and then I can confirm this double opt in. And here you just create the account. I don't even know to that you created the account because this is Check out right. So I don't expect you to create an account and keep my data. That's the that's the real problem here. Yeah. Er no, it's an advisement, that's what happened in the process. You you could do that. There's also on the admin side the the option to put in the uh, terms that the user has to agree to during checkout. And so they'll, they'll have to be required to accept um, the terms during checkout. And you can specify any article. What it looks like is checkout of guests is kind of a it's more like selling feature. It's not really different from checking out as a registered user. So yeah, it's just getting rid of the registration step, just making it a, a faster workflow for the user. But I mean, you could, if, if, you're, if you're selling a lot of in Germany or if you're a customer, I'm sure you could change the language here and just say your information will be stored. I believe Virtual Mars has an option to register. Yeah, I, I think I looked at their database table. They recreate a lot of the IDs, so they could then create a user account ID number and then flush it of data after a certain number of days if they wanted to. We have, um, I think the resolution for this would probably be involving the user info table where we store where we store the first last name phone number fax number um, and any preferences so we could use this ID uh, and allow I guess a true guest checkout which is what you what Germany would want um, or you just call it quick checkout or call it quick checkout and not give them the idea that they're not checkout but again that's a language as a shop screen yeah yeah Say again? Uh, you link the Joma for user ID. Yes, that's this one right here. That's this field right here. Yeah. This is just a unique ID for the. Uh, this case you can use uh, for 
something like you know, about OpenID or some of these other authorization plugins for Joomla? If Joomla is using OpenID, yeah. This, we're just letting Joomla handle all that. Right. And they don't want to be contacted by a company in Chinese. So that's why they are using guests. They, they don't really care about the storing email address or some shipping address in their database. They don't want to use passwords and these kind of things for buying one product on your uh, right. store. I think you know you could resolve it in several different ways. You could you could flush the database the tables afterwards of that particular user if they wanted to check out as a guest. Um, we just no, but that's what I was about to say. We, yeah. We'd have to track somewhere that they opted to guest check out. Yeah. But then you flash all the information about one one time user or some customer. Uh, what happened in, in order history when you pick in the order? Yeah, that's also nothing. That that's why we assumed. I, I've never heard of a store that would just delete orders after thirty days. But if you have if you have a different ID as opposed to the Joomla user ID to identify that user, you, we could actually resolve the issue in Tienda. Or, or, no, or, 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 or yeah, I, I think that if you were going to do it, you wouldn't, you wouldn't flush your order history. And so you would therefore keep their mailing address, for example. Um, you would just be flushing the email and the password. It's based on local law, I think. It's based on or locality. Or, 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 So I guess we would, we would just change the, the language right now so that it's not checking out as a guest, it's quick checkout. And if you wanted to, I guess, address the international legal laws, you could just delete the email and password from the account. But you have to maintain the order its integrity, so you're going to have a little bit of data about the user. Right. Right. Yeah, I think I think the Joomla's user at database table doesn't require a unique ID, uh, unique email. It does. <coughs> Is it enforcing it to be unique here? It's it's a unique. The registration process. Okay, all right. So we could, I mean, we could override that and just put in a dummy email address, not send them any information, maintain the orders information as needed, but not create an account for their particular email address. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, so payment options right now are handled as plugins. Uh, we currently have to check out authorized.net, offline payments, PayPal, um, and Pagseguro is being developed by um, Marco, who's here. Two Swedish ones are being developed by Henrik, who's also here today. So we've got, we've got um, and a couple more are being developed internally, like Google Checkout. Um, can't remember the other ones. But um, the, that process looked like, where was I? I can't remember which one I had enabled. I think it's blowing up because I don't have internet and it's trying to. All right, so the checkout process shows you the orders allows you to select a particular shipping method, 
Let's do overnight. Updates the uh, order total based on the, the shipping method you selected. And this is still buggy. We literally just changed this the other day, so that's not good. All right, well, can't show you right now because I broke it. We might actually have it. Okay, I'm sorry, we ran late. Any more questions before we? Oh yeah, sorry, if you wanna see it.